Hey everybody, we'll get started in two minutes. Two minute warning everyone, two minutes. All right, welcome everyone. It's time to get started. Today we will be in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's see. It looks like, uh, that looks like last week's PowerPoint. Uh, did I possibly give you the wrong one? Let me know if I did. It'll be okay. We don't have to have it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, before, before we get started, let's begin with prayer, and then we'll jump right in, okay? Let's pray. Our Lord, our Father, our God, who lives, who reigns, we give you all glory and honor and thanksgiving. As your prophet declares, your mercies are new every morning, and we're so thankful for the blessing of getting to experience another morning and your new mercies. We thank you for the gift of your word, which still lives and still works, and we pray you bless us as we reflect on the life of one of your servants. Help us to learn and understand this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so, 1 Kings chapter 18, a whopping 46 verses in chapter 18. We will read as we're able to read from the text, but time will probably get the best of us near the end. And so, we'll just see how things go. Um, just know we may have to just summarize at places and at points. What I want to really emphasize before we get going is what Elijah will declare later in verse 36. He's going to later pray to, to God, I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. While we go through this study, we're going to find little dabs and touches of Elijah's personality. It's very similar to how in the New Testament, for example, take Paul. He wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but there are little dabs and touches of his personality that kind of bleed forth on the page. Uh, but overall, it's the Spirit's influence and direction. I believe the same thing we're going to see today. Everything that Elijah does is going to be done at the word of the Lord but we will see, like for example, when he starts making fun of the prophets of Baal, I think it's kind of clear Elijah's personality is shining forth in that moment. So just understand major actions, we're going to assume Elijah's the one up to it. All right, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18, and let's start in verse 1. We'll read all the way through 16. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe 
in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and fed them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water into all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say, He is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, Go tell your Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go, tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went. To meet Ahab and told him. So Ahab went to meet Elijah. In total, there is no rain throughout the land for three and a half years. We learned from two New Testament texts that we looked at last time. At some point near the end of that three and a half years, the Lord commands Elijah, as we see, to show himself to Ahab and promises, does the Lord to send rain. Benson writes, as we, we note those, that, that pink wording there, In going, Elijah showed strong faith, resolute obedience, and invincible courage, and that he durst, at God's command, run into the mouth of this raging lion. Meanwhile, Ahab, as you may remember, the wicked king of Samaria, the northern kingdom, um, more wicked than those who came before him, He simultaneously sends a servant named Obadiah to help him search for grass for the king's livestock. I don't know if that stood out to anyone. Uh, Might make you scratch your head a little bit to think about, but if you're just a commoner in that kingdom, you would have to wonder, does this king care more about his cattle and his mules and his animals than he does about us? There's a severe famine going on in the land, and so... If everybody knew about this, this would not be a good look, perhaps. This Obadiah is likely not the same one who writes the book of prophecy we find later, one of the minor prophets. Uh, That's several decades, if not several centuries later. In total, there are 13 different Obadiahs in the Old Testament. The name Obadiah means servant of Jehovah. So this Obadiah, why would an evil king like an Ahab keep around a guy like Obadiah, well, maybe, maybe just maybe, we're going to learn later that the people are riding the fence. Elijah's going to say, why are, you, why are you limping back and forth between two opinions? Uh, why can't you make a decision who you're going to serve, Baal or the one true living God? Who is it going to be? And it could be that Ahab is similarly riding the fence like the people. It's no surprise for the people to follow their leader. Um, But we also might think in the Old Testament two examples of Joseph and Daniel, there too, who were were good men who served under evil monarchs. Um, And those, those kings, they respected the God that Joseph and that Daniel served. Uh, Joseph and Daniel, and probably Obadiah too, they were trustworthy and reliable. That would be a good reason you want to keep around a guy like this. Um, 
may have been also as simple as the Lord granting favor in the sight of Ahab, as he did like Joseph. Joseph, uh, the Lord was working all throughout Joseph's narrative, uh, giving him favor in the sight of Potiphar, um, the one who was in the head of the prison, gave him favor in his sight as well. And so maybe God's just being, is with Obadiah, just as he was with Joseph, just as he was with Daniel. Uh, we, we definitely see God's providence at work here because Obadiah is in this high position. He hears of Jezebel's plot to murder prophets, and that allows him to uh, save a hundred of them. Uh, Spurgeon writes the following, As it is horrible to find a Judas among the apostles, so it is grand to discover an Obadiah among Ahab's courtiers. Uh, and we often dwell on the bad part of that narrative. You know, the thing that stands out is, oh, did you hear about that eldership at such and such church? Did you hear about that one guy and the horrible things he's done and how he's been just excommunicated from that church now? Like, there's that story. We, we always dwell on the, the, the one person in the, the, the high up seat in religion and the horrible things they do. Instead, I'd like to encourage us to, to look at the, the, the one person in the midst of all the sin who is yet still living for God in spite of challenging circumstances. We, we should focus on the Obadiahs a little bit more. Um, I want to encourage that. Along the way, Obadiah encounters Elijah, who desires the king's servant to go and tell Ahab that Elijah is here. Obadiah is going to communicate the following. First, in verse 10, he tells us, that as Ahab has been searching for Elijah, the king is forcing leaders of neighboring nations to swear they're not hiding the prophet. Uh, Next, we notice in verse 12 that Obadiah fears the Spirit of the Lord will carry Elijah somewhere else by the time Obadiah returns with the king. Uh, You know, there's some, if you've ever read the, in Acts 8, the story of the conversion of, uh, of the Ethiopian eunuch, Um, At the very end of that, Philip the Evangelist, we learn the Spirit of the Lord carries him away. And there's some people that believe that is a a miraculous carrying away. I mean, you get like Star Trek teleportation kind of vibes, you know, if that helps you at all. We're not sure. Uh, Some believe that Jesus experiences the same, possibly in Matthew 4, chapter 4 and verse 1, uh, when the Spirit leads him into the wilderness. Is it a walk or is it not? We definitely know post-resurrection Jesus had this ability to be one place and then be another place. You may remember he was having dinner with those two men after the road, after the road to Emmaus, stopped and had a meal with them, and he vanished before their eyes. Um, and so I don't, we're not exactly sure if this is the kind of thing Obadiah is fearing. Maybe, maybe not. But here's the one thing we'll tell you about Elijah. We know for sure he has a way of disappearing in a miraculous way. When he disappears entirely in 2 Kings, the chariots of fire. Uh, So maybe that's a valid fear that Obadiah has. Uh, If if Elijah does disappear, Obadiah brings Ahab there, and Elijah's gone, then he's afraid he's going to be executed. Uh, Jezebel, as we again have already talked about, has been killing the prophets of the Lord. What I want you to understand is when we get to chapter 19, and when she makes a threat on Elijah's life next week, Lord willing, when we get to that, this should validate her threat. She's a woman who does what she says she's going to do because she's been killing prophets. And so when she says, Elijah, I'm going to take you out, uh, it makes sense for him to probably run because she's a woman who's kept her word when it comes to those things. Uh, it makes his fear natural. Returning to the main text, Obadiah relates how he's hidden two groups of 50 in caves. Uh, Think about, you know, there's there's some some smarts in that. You don't hide them all in one place uh, because if one hiding place is found out, you still have the other 50 who have been hidden. Um, And there's also maybe some matters of convenience when it comes to that. Uh, Caves, they figure prominently in Israel's history. Uh, in the battle against the five Canaanite kings, you may remember they hid in a cave and Joshua and his people trapped them in the cave until they could handle the rest of the battle and then they brought them out and and executed them all. Um, Also, 
Uh, there is in Judges uh, chapter 6 when uh, before Gideon rose to prominence, they were hiding in caves, the Israel, people of Israel, to, to get away. David hides in a cave, you may remember. Uh, in Hebrews 11, in the, the, the story about or the hall of faith, we find that those of faith wandered around in dens and caves. And so, anyway, regardless, Obadiah pleads, do not send me on this death mission. As part of his testimony, he says that I feared the Lord from my youth. Notice that in verse 12. Uh, when it comes to the most evil, this is true. After the flood, the Lord makes a covenant with Noah, and he expresses how some, how the children of man are evil from their youth. Uh, however, we also may think of the opposite being true. You remember what, if you've studied about the rich young ruler before, what's true of him? He says, all these I have kept from my youth, right? Um, and also, uh, we have other examples. Goliath has been a man of, of war since his youth. Joshua was assisting Moses from his youth. Samuel, in his farewell address, says that he has been faithful since his youth. And here comes Obadiah kind of with this similar claim. It's not too unlike what the older son will say in the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, do you recall? He says, I have always served you. There is this insinuation that the older son has with the father that, hey, the younger son, he's ran off to the far country. He has been unfaithful, but I've been with you from the very beginning and haven't left your side. And so what I would like to express is, is that this from my youth has its share of blessings, but it has its share of challenges and pitfalls. We have to be careful. Uh, McLaren writes the following, quote, Fishermen catch lobsters and the like by means of baskets with one opening constructed in a manner so that the entrance is easy, but that a ring of sharp points oppose all attempts at turning back and getting out. The world lays pots of that sort, and many a young man and woman glides smoothly in and finds it impossible to get out. Sin lies to us by first saying, it's too soon to be religious. And then it lies to us by saying, it is too late. And I think that, that quote, that's the end of the quote, that's, that does a nice job of encapsulating the blessing side of from your youth being faithful to God. Uh, because that is so true. Uh, sin is so easy to slip into and so difficult to get out, like those lobster traps, all right? And so Obadiah claims he's been faithful since youth. Uh, nevertheless, Obadiah brings Elijah and or brings Ahab to Elijah, and that then gets us to verses 17 to 21. I'm going to go ahead and summarize these verses because I don't know how much we'll get to read. So here's a quick summary of the rest of the chapter. Elijah will challenge Ahab and his false prophets to a showdown between Baal and God. Each of the servants of the respective deity will attempt to call down fire from heaven at their altars. After hours of failure for Baal's prophets, the God of Israel consumes Elijah's sacrifice and its surroundings with fire at the petition of Elijah. The prophets of Baal, they're executed. And then in Elijah's persistence prayer, the Lord will send rain on the land. Let's take a look at 17 to 21 together. 17 to 21. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather is all of Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel, and Elijah came near to all the people and said, 
How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people did not answer Him a word. Now, now real quick, uh, those of you who kind of know where this thing is headed, uh, we are going to look at Elijah for several weeks, and then we're going to look at John the Baptist, who is the Elijah to come. Uh, Those of you who studied John the Baptist before, do you hear the way he's talking to this king? Do, do you, do you, can you hear that, that venom in his voice? Can you sense it? Because that's going to come out in John the Baptist's way of dealing with things too. Uh, so we want to just go ahead and bring that up uh, now because we're going to see it later in the life of John the Baptist as well. Upon entering the presence of Elijah for the first time in three years, Ahab calls out the prophet and says he's a troubler of Israel. Achan, by the way, A-C-H-A-N, Achan, um, is described as that. Um, Remember, it's because of his dishonesty and um, theft and disobedience that some fall in that battle against Ai in Joshua 7, and because of that, he is labeled a troubler of Israel. Well, so is Elijah here. It's not uncommon for the unfaithful to shift blame to others when there's bad things that happen. Um, You may have examples in your own life of where you've been blamed in a similar way, but we see that playing out here, and typically those who remain faithful to the Lord seem to be most often in the crosshairs of such folks. Take a look with me at 18a. If you look at verse 18 uh, for a moment, if you look at verse 18, Uh, Elijah, when accused of being a troubler of Israel, answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. The blame lies with Ahab and also his fathers. Um, If a little Hebrew grammar, the first verb abandoned is plural, and the second verb followed is singular. Y'all... You and your fathers have abandoned the commandments of the Lord. But you, Ahab, not only have done that, but you have worshipped and followed the Baals. He in particular, probably at least due to the influence of his wife, uh, have fallen into that. So this is a bold reply in the face of an angry king. Um, But Elijah, in a way, holds this kingdom in the palm of his hand. He's, in a way, in control. Uh, just an interesting note, what we, can, what we see here is that while Elijah challenges the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, only the prophets of Baal will show up, it seems. It could be that the prophets of Asherah chicken out uh, of this challenge. Uh, it could be this is just some uh, word usage thing that really the prophets of Baal stand for all of them. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, But we want to notice at the end of verse 19, those prophets of Asherah are the ones who seem to eat at Jezebel's table. So again, we have a disgrace. We're in a time of great famine, and the way they're presented by Elijah is is we've got these these evil adulterers that are getting to dine and, and feast and banquet while, again, people suffer. So, sad. Um, Asherah is the female goddess worshipped by the Sidonians. Uh, If you recall, Jezebel is from Sidon, and uh, so she is the deity that goes along with them. Before the challenge at Mount Carmel begins, Elijah addresses the crowd which is gathered at the event. He says, how long will you go limping between two opinions? That word, that Hebrew word for limping, um, refers to a little, little bird that hops between branches. Hop, 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 hop. That's how they are with their faith. They're just going from branch to branch to branch, like those little bitty birds, if you've ever seen them, that just seem to just kind of move and hop around so quickly. Essentially, think about this. The prophets of Baal have had three plus years to deliver and provide rain for the people, and they have nothing to show for it. That should have settled the matter right there, I think. More broadly, Elijah's words speak, though, to a history of divided hearts. How long, 
Not just those three, I mean, these three years, people, how long, you all, but also, again, it could go back. Remember, we, we talked about the fathers of Ahab, and I think that applies to the people as well. How long will you go limping between two opinions? The Lord desired for all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and strength, all of you, to be devoted to Him. But you've been limping. Joshua warns the same thing. Choose you this day who you will serve. Is it going to be the, the gods from back in Egypt? Is it going to be the gods in this land? Is it going to be the Lord God? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord God. And so in voicing this displeasure, Elijah is speaking for the Lord. I want to make sure we emphasize that because that very first thing we said, all these things I've done at your word, Elijah said. One commentary says that fire was the element over which Baal was supposed to preside. Lumbee says Baal was especially the sun god. The pulpit commentary says he was the lord of the elements and forces of nature, at least supposedly. Um, if you've never had a deep dive into the plagues in Egypt, uh, you may know this. If, if you don't, this might be new, and it's kind of cool. But each plague, it seems, uh, targeted a specific false god of the Egyptian people. Every single one of them. Like an example might be, you may have heard of the sun god before. Well, darkness targeted the sun god. Uh, and, and so just in the same way as God did that, so this does. This targets Baal, who was supposed to be in charge of fire, um, in, in charge of the heat, so to speak. And so, of course, at the end of this, God's going to prove himself the, ele- the, the, the Lord of all these things in nature. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to take a look at that. Uh, let's continue on. Let's take a look at verses 22 to 35. We're doing okay. We're going we're gonna to read ahead. 22 to 35. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bowls be given to us and let them choose one bowl for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire on it. And I'll prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I'll call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it's well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many. And call upon the name of your God and put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he's God. Either he is musing, or he's relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud with, and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been broken down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two sails of seed. And, and, and he put it the wood in order and, and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. So Elijah stacks the deck against himself here. First of all, we have 450 verses 1. Next, he lets them get first pick and lets them go first. If you, you may not know this, this is a tremendous advantage. Imagine they had succeeded. If they would have succeeded in getting fire in this imaginary world I'm taking you in, uh, 
If they had succeeded in getting fire, Elijah may not have gotten his chance. The, the people, the crowd may have rushed upon him and killed him right then and there. Um, so another way he stacked the deck against himself. He gives them plenty of time, and when the sun is possibly at its highest point uh, in the middle of the day. When it's Elijah's turn, we may notice that he dunks with water. He makes a trench of water around. So again, stacking the deck against himself, against God. God has no problem with the stacked deck. Different approaches. You notice this? Uh, I, I hope that our approach can more resemble Elijah than the prophets of Baal. Uh, they dance. They cut themselves after being mocked. They shout from morning till noon. It just feels like a lot of work and a lot of effort, a lot of straining uh, going on. Uh, in Acts, uh, when, when Paul is in Ephesus, you, I don't know if you remember, they, they worshiped Artemis. And we, we have this picture of when just there's chaos there, the people saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And we read that they did that for two straight hours, I think it was, over and over and over again. And it's very similar to what they're doing. Notice, if you go back, uh, let's see, verse 26. They prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us. O oh, Baal, answer us. Over and over again. You get that same vibe. We have this great literary touch, though, at the end of verse 29. No voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Lumby records the following, The pomp and splendor of the priests of Baal, glittering no doubt with gorgeous vestments, would show the more because of the rough, shaggy garb of the Tishbite, whose congenial abode was the mountaintop's or the fastnesses of Gilead. Uh, you know, I think people probably have a better vision of what John the Baptist looked like than Elijah, but they had very similar looks from, from what we can gather. Uh, rough. <laughs> Didn't look all that great. And these prophets of Baal would have been dressed to the nines, so to speak. One has said the following, quote, Devotion to your religion does not mean acceptance by the one true God. That's an important message because we, we very much live in a universalist culture where you do it your way, I'll do it my way, and hey, as long as you mean it with all your heart, whatever it is, uh, God's going to accept you. Uh, these guys were in it with 100% of themselves, uh, yet it's very clear they were not accepted by God. Barnes writes, the pagan gods, as we know from Greek and Latin classics, ate and drank went on journeys, slept, conversed, quarreled, and fought. You know, if you've ever seen like Clash of the Titans or something like that, you kind of think about how they act, uh, not as the one true God. And that's kind of the things that uh, Elijah's mocking and making fun of them. Elijah mocks the failed attempts of Baal and his prophets before beginning his own efforts. Again, he and John the Baptist have this fire in their tongues. Elijah appears to take several steps to unite with all the nations of Israel. So it may have seemed as if Elijah was on his own, but what we're going to see is not. Notice he called the people to come near, first of all. Next, he then used 12 stones to build an altar, the same number of the tribes of Israel. Um, you may remember Moses and Joshua. Joshua is probably is, is more on your memory, using 12 stones to make a similar memorial. Elijah then offers a prayer. If you notice, we haven't gotten to this yet at the top of 36. The top of 36. At the time of the offering of the oblation, um, many scholars believe that's meaning to say at the time of the evening sacrifice. So what's going on in theory is we're in the northern kingdom, remember. Way in the southern kingdom in Jerusalem, there is an evening sacrifice going on. And at that time, this is one of the times of prayer, everyone, hopefully, who is faithful to God is praying to God. So understand, he has timed the sacrifice to unite with all those who are praying with God. You may have thought you had a lot at 450 prophets, but Elijah's like, I got a whole nation on my side. 
all those at least who are faithful to God, whether it be the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, or wherever, they're all praying in the direction of Jerusalem, and it unites them. So, pretty cool stuff. He also uses, notice, just one more thing, because I'm a math guy, was it four jars of water three times? Math here, four times three is 12, yes, just because that's cool. Got to bring that up. So, we take a look uh, and we look at Elijah's prayer, and I've got this up here uh, for you to see. I want to bring out some things that stand out. He gives God the honor, the glory, and the power. He's calm. It's not frantic or frenzied, not many words. You remember it was the uh, tax collector who said a whopping, what is it, eight words? You can correct, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Ah, seven. Seven words. He was the one who went home justified. Seven word prayer. If this is all Elijah said, very short and sweet. Um, so nothing too, too crazy. He, he noticed, he says at the end of that, oh Lord, our God, let the people know that you have turned their hearts back. I mean, has it really happened yet? Not really, but the battle belongs to the Lord. I love speaking in that tense. One of the things we're going to find at the end of Malachi that's going to be said about John the Baptist is that his, his responsibility and his mission is to turn the hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers. So both Elijah and John the Baptist, their mission was to turn hearts. We might think of that as repentance, um, is maybe a way to think about that. So both of them were, were doing that. This is the first time. I want to go ahead. So looking at that, you see that title? Elijah prays, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. This is the first time since the burning bush that anyone has called him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isn't that just like poetic? This God who, lets, who, who, who ignites a flame on a bush yet it isn't consumed. And here's Elijah. He's needing to call down fire from heaven. And he uses that title for God that hasn't been used since the burning bush. Like, come on, that's just, that's good stuff. Uh, wow. And, and so that's a, a great prelude to what's going to happen, of course, in a moment. This is in accord. Uh, what we find out, let me check the time before we move forward. Yeah, we probably need to move ahead. So, of course, fire comes down. Uh, the Lord blesses the sacrifice uh, of Elijah. And in response, if we continue on and look verse 40, Elijah commands uh, that they seize the prophets of Baal and let none of them escape in verse 40. And uh, so this is in accord with the law of Moses. This is what was commanded uh, when it came to those who wanted you to worship other gods. Uh, we, should, we should emphasize maybe it's possible these prophets would have been involved in those wrongful murders of God's prophets. Uh, but as we mentioned already, everything's being done at the word of the Lord. Uh, don't, don't think that Elijah took, took matters into his own hands here. He uh, would have been told by God to do this. Um, all in all, this is quite the scene. The king's very own prophets are punished in the presence of the helpless and seemingly silent monarch. That's one of the things that just stands out to you about this narrative. You read it, and Ahab just seems so passive. Sounds a lot like his marriage. We can read that and notice who wears the pants in that family. And, and, and similarly here, he just seems just in the background of it all. Uh, and so, as we continue on, Elijah is going to pray for rain. Um, as the Lord commanded him at the beginning of the chapter. However, as Elijah anticipates the welcome rain, it, um, he encourages the king, who's probably not eaten the entire day, to eat and drink, verse 41. Now, some people see this as a gracious and merciful act by Elijah. Others see it as Elijah saying, hey, you go do your thing. You go sit and you recline at a table, and I'll go do my thing. I'll go to the table of the Lord and pray. Maybe that's going on as well. We're not sure. When Ahab dines, Elijah returns to the throne room of God in prayer. Surprisingly, it appears as if the Lord's response is not immediate. Would you? How about that? You know, even Elijah, you know, it wasn't just like that. Uh, 
So Elijah and his servant must be persistent. They seek the desired rain a total of seven times, if you go all the way to 44. Seven times. Even Elijah had to pray seven times. It's just remarkable because I think we just assume one prayer, that's it, that's done. Um, there's, a, there's a blessing in persistence. God has a reason for persistence. And we should emulate that quality uh, as well in our own prayer lives. Um, if Elijah had to pray seven times for the rain, then we, we should be willing to pray more. When the rain finally arrives, as we get to 45 and 46, Elijah races ahead of Ahab's chariot. We believe that the journey from Jezreel to Mount Carmel was 14 miles. Um, and the Spirit of the Lord most likely, as we, we look in verse 46, empowers Elijah to run all the way there. So Elijah, 14 miles, just ran half a marathon. Elijah, on, the, the, on his back, he has a sticker that says 13.1 on it, plus a little extra, because he did that. Uh, multiple commentators share that, that such a run actually, if you notice, he runs out in front of the chariot. Zoom, as that picture up there implies. They actually say that shows deference and humility to King Ahab rather than showing him up. Maybe he did. Here's what I will tell you. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Elijah, in the most clear way, is a forerunner, a forerunner for the king. He is a forerunner for the evil king. John the Baptist is going to come along and be a forerunner for the one true king, uh, Jesus. So kind of an interesting parallel there. Barnes writes, as you notice, there was a little cloud. If you look at verse 44, a little cloud. Barnes writes, sailors know full well that such a cloud on the far horizon is often the forerunner of a violent storm. I know some folks who can feel it in their bones when the rain's coming. Benson adds, great blessings often rise from small beginnings and showers of plenty from a cloud of a span long. Let us therefore never despise the day of small things, but hope and wait for greater things from it. Uh, we should add, he tells Ahab to get going and get a head start. What happens in a place where there's not much vegetation, it's just a bunch of, of dirt, and a whole big old downpour comes? It's a big old sloppy mess. And in a way, that was blessing Ahab with his chariot. Those wheels could have gotten stuck in the mud, letting him get a head start and get going before the rain comes. Uh, and then one more note. Tradition states that Elijah's servant if you may notice, is actually the widow's son from Zarephath. We're not sure if that's true, but that's tradition. Pretty good stuff. Elijah, man, awesome, brave, courageous, strong. This guy has, has, has no weakness whatsoever until we get to verse 1 next time. And remember, this is a man with a nature like ours. We can be at the highest of highs, and then we can hit a low spot. And we're going to hit, notice he hits that low spot next time, and I encourage you to join us for that. Let's close with prayer, and then you'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Our Father, what an amazing, amazing real-life story that you gave us the opportunity to reflect on today. Uh, we're thankful that you chose to work through a humble servant like Elijah. It becomes very clear that if you are for us, who can be against us? And even when there's just one, there can be hundreds on the other side, but us plus you is greater than any force on the other side that the devil can mount. So we thank you, Father, for your, the blessing of being with us, and we pray that this, this account will give us courage to stand up for you, to no longer ride the fence, jump back and forth, but to give all of our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.